thanks for the introduction. Now that you know a little bit about me, uh, let me ask you one question. Who of you is, yeah, makes a living of music engraving? Can you raise your hands? Okay. So there are people who can do that. <laughs> Okay, um, my question for this talk um, is yeah, really what I really want to, 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 to get to the bottom of um, how digitization changed and influenced our, our music engraving business and what's the current state of that. But, um, but it's, it's a really difficult uh, question to answer, as, as Ben mentioned, because it's not very transparent. Um, so, what I'm saying will be mostly giving you an insight in what we at Rotenkraft Berlin are doing. So making a start to, to become visible and tell you we are doing, uh, we are working this way and maybe at the end we can find out how this situation is, is on your side. Um, in the background you already see the original inspiration why I had this fascination for, for music type and software, it's this score. Um, and if we ask, if we paraphrase this question, our digital yet as has uh, a digitization, yeah, what is the term, disrupted uh, our, our industry, then we of course have to say, yes, that has been the case for several decades. Um, computers like score have been, been used since then to, to typeset music, and today everything is added by computer. Um, and now digitization has even gone so far as to push these extra tools out of the market. They are now too, too cumbersome for, for today's work, too slow, not efficient enough. Um, so maybe the most important uh, um, thing of uh, the most, most important effect of, of digitization is maybe that everybody today can engrave music. They can use the same uh, software that, that we can, it's accessible to, to everybody. And I think that's, that's actually a, a great situation that we are in. Um, especially, I'm, I'm always excited to see conductors, for example, for, for youth orchestras who are arranging for, for their players and yeah, arranging for, for the symphony orchestra, creating the parts and so on, would be impossible for them without decent software. They are not engravers, they are conductors, they are teachers, maybe, and they, they can still do it. Uh, but of course, uh, this development also has its, its downsides. So for me, it's really annoying when I have to, to sing from music where it is maybe self-published, that where the text is so small I can hardly read it because um, I'm, my eyesight is still decent. But mm -hmm. that, that happens, or, or parts uh, to play from parts where there are no decent page turns. So basic, very basic things that go wrong frequently. Um, yeah, and. It's, this, this fact that everybody can type the music is maybe also giving rise to the expectation that everybody can also deliver ready-to-print music. Um, and we are working with composers who are actually really great engravers and who can do that. But as soon as it comes to tight deadlines or large jobs, that's of course not, not possible for them anymore. <coughs> and not every composer or, or every uh, um, editor or publisher of um, uh, or author of, of music content is, is a good engraver and you shouldn't expect them to be really um, they have other things that they can do quite well so um, maybe it's because um, I'm sorry I forgot to phrase out the, the questions um, if, if we phrase the, the, the question differently and ask do we fully take advantage of digitization yet um, then I can tell you something what we are doing right now and how digital we are yet. So maybe it's, it's because everybody can type that music today that our jobs um, have shifted more to, to yeah, expert jobs, if, if, you, if you want. So basically everything that's large, maybe that have tight, tight deadlines and especially contemporary music and unusual notation, these are things um, that, that, that come to us and that we can, can deliver. Um, well, and of course, jobs uh, with high quality standards and then go uh, has had many points that I don't have to repeat right now. What, what is important here, um, yeah, and uh, but I would like to, to add one aspect of, of quality, and this is the quality of, of the data <coughs> how you input things, 
how you make sure that everything is also processable with uh, automated tools afterwards because to, to, to be able to do that you need decent data, you need uh, consistency and that's one thing that is important for us and that we try to achieve. And in, in this area um, we are also interested in, in how to export, exchange data for analysis, for importing somewhere else, for, for uses outside of, of the original software. Um, and in this area we also uh, started to co-maintain the MEI export plugin for Sibelius, for example. And we are also uh, um, increasingly um, approached by, by other people who need this data. For example, um, developers of, of apps that, that need music data. And this becomes more, uh, more important, our role as consultant. But not, also, not only for, for software developers, as uh, Ben told you, it's, it's always good to have long-term uh, long partnerships, for example, with composers to, uh, to work out with them how they could use their software, how to create a decent setup, and yeah, be their partner in, in, in this regard. And also, you saw the, the, the example with the, with the many, many files that have to be organized from a musicological project. Um, this is also high potential in, in, in this area where we could um, collaborate with these projects to make sure they uh, have a, a tight, um, have a proper base, uh, base that, they, that they can build upon. But our core expertise is, of course, still uh, creating sheet music. So, um, most important for us here is really to, as Elaine also said, to, to, to support rehearsal and performance as, as good as we can. And we need the kind of quality that she talked about. Um, but another factor that, that is important to support rehearsal and performance is, of course, that you have to deliver in time. Because if you don't deliver in time, uh, the, the premiere can't happen. Musicians can't, can, can't play a piece. So these are two goals that are conflicting at times. And it's uh, not easy to fulfill them both. And we have to make trade-offs constantly. And of course, for us, it's important to have a look at the economic side. Um, we have to make sure that we use our time and personnel efficiently, um, so work productively. And we, we have, for us, it's important that we know how to scale up to uh, work in parallel with, uh, with more colleagues um, to, to finish larger jobs, uh, finish on time. So, um, how do we try to achieve that? I, I would like to, to walk you through the stages of production that we usually follow. So this is sort of a prototypical workflow that we, in general, follow. Um, so when we receive a manuscript, we, we mark it up, we check it, um, we prepare it for input. Um, once the music is input, we have the first, first round of proofreading, and that might repeat until we have a proper, proper data that we then use uh, to create parts and layout, which are again proofread, and uh, finally we have a cleanup stage where we try to make sure we, we uh, reach a level of quality that increases readability and supports the performer. And of course, a final round of proof. So, to go through that, um, the first stage manuscript preparation, preparation is actually um, kind of an editorial phase in some sense, where we check for everything, make clear that any open questions are answered with uh, composers or with publishers. Um, we might do some first corrections to make sure that standards are followed um, to, 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 yeah, which is also important that musicians can actually uh, um, perform successfully, basically. Um, um, <coughs> what we do, what we see here, what, one thing that we automate is um, First thing what we do is we number bars and we have now a tool that we where we have just we just have to mark up the bar lines and it counts for us, which is very handy if you miscount or if the manuscript isn't clear, then you don't have to write in everything again. So this is a little helper, uh, but otherwise this phase is uh, mostly uh, by hand on paper. But we have very successfully tried um, in, a, in a larger project to use PDF annotations. <coughs> multiple files and using um, XFDF data that you can create from, from these annotations to, to, to manage larger, larger loads of, of manuscripts. But this is not generally used 
but we see potential in, in that direction definitely. For simple, uh, for simple jobs or for a standard jobs, it's far easier and quicker to, to make everything back. So next stage is input. So one important thing is, of course, to have a proper setup before we start the input, um, and to make sure that, that all the um, that the setup includes the proper instruments and proper instrument in, uh, in proper tr transpositions, uh, the proper line styles and text styles. So basically everything that we need, and then we can also split up the work um, and, and give it to work in parallel on, on multiple files, and they will still be compatible, so to say. Um, for us, it's of course important to have clean input, so for example, that everything is anchored correctly, that we know which things belong where, um, that we use the styles correctly, and so on. This makes sure that we can process these things with some, some automated tools later on. One thing that Werner talked about, which I repeated in the background, you see the same example is uh, one step of input where we complete the input by the composers based on some, some uh, rules that we establish together with them. This is the, basically the only automated thing in, 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 in the input phase that, that we have. Uh, when we talk about digitization input, I think we have to at least mention uh, OMR, so optical music recognition, but for most of our work it's, it hasn't been provably useful because um, if we receive handwritten manuscript, as you've seen, what, uh, what Werner showed, um, OMR will not be successful, and we are mostly dealing with contemporary uh, music, sometimes complex notation styles, um, and OMR will not give us any uh, good results or clean results that we, that we can work with. And for simple music, it's, uh, um, it's also quick and uh, cheap to, to input. And we can, we are then sure that we have the proper setup and uh, we use every, uh, uh, proper styles, and we have clean data that we can later use. The second stage is proofreading, and this is sort of a hotspot in the whole process because it recurs uh, after every every step, really. Um, this phase is, can be split into three three steps. It's uh, first we, we mark every every mistakes or every improvements that that we want to be corrected. And we carry out the corrections and we check if the corrections are carried out correctly. Um, this is also a phase that we still do on, on paper, we are not digital in that regard. We are looking into using um, iPad Pro uh, or something if that is any of any use for it, if that has any advantages over, over paper. Uh, anyone uh, um, correcting things on tablets or screen? Okay, it's way better. So. We, we, we might talk there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and after after correcting, uh, we have uh, some 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 helpers for, for checking how the corrections were done. So, simple thing is just to use PDF comparison, but of course that only works if you have a uh, um, layer that, that stays the same. Otherwise, we have content-based tools that we we use, um, for example, to concentrate on only rhythms and pitches to 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 check this aspect or compare everything except positions because we don't care about positional changes, we just care for the content. We could uh, just look at text and then we have the tools to, to concentrate on specific checks. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big improvement because we can also detect any accidents that happen. So if somebody deleted something accidentally and this would then be visible in, in this stage very, very quickly. Um, yeah, so you, this is an example, for example. We have two files, we have a, a change and, and the pitches, and our tool will then mark them right. Easy. Uh, I mean, to understand. Not to implement. Um, next stage, parts and layout. Um, there is a challenge here, uh, because the, the promise that uh, linked parts or dynamic parts, depending on how the software calls it, does not really deliver on its promise in, in our, for our work. Um, okay, there are more people than me. Yeah. Um, so we, we have to, to split into our instruments and so on, and usually we end up with two scores. We have a conductor score and one score that we use for, for, for part extraction. And if we have to split work to, to more people because we have to parallelize, then we might also extract those parts and work on the parts. So yeah, that's, 
that's not particularly ideal, but um, yeah, that's, that's the process. So we are, um, we are really looking forward to, to the, the Dorico features. Um, I was going to say that the condensing feature of Dorico wasn't give, giving us the, the control that we needed for, for now, but I read yesterday that there were huge changes, so we might have to look again, and I'm not saying that now. Okay. We have to check it. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to the, to the cleanup stage. Um, this is the stage uh, where we try to increase uh, the readability and maybe aim for some level of elegance if time and budget permits. Um, I've, I've talked about plugin solutions in several steps. Uh, for example, for adding those lines, this was a plugin solution or preparing uh, things. This is also a plugin solution. So this is also a typical phase where you might use plugins to, to not have to do a tedious work uh, over and over again. You try to automate what it, what's possible. Um, one one uh, such solution will be presented here uh, the, the, uh, by Dan Angermüller, the perfect layout plugin. This is a typical phase that might be used in, in this phase. Um, the problem with plugins is we're using mostly Finale and CPUs and Finale yeah, has no official support for any plugin, right, the writing any plugins anymore. There is a third party plugin that uh, still allows us to write plugins, but there's no official support, support whatsoever, or no professional support whatsoever. And it's, yeah, it's not maintained very, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's only maintained sporadically, really. So, far from ideal here. And apart from that, the, the API is quite yeah, cumbersome to use, really. It's, it's hard to find out how things work. Sibelius, on the other hand, the, has a decent interface for, for programmers to, to write plugins. So the API is, is quite decent, but it's much more limited than the Finale um, API. And the language is a little yeah, questionable. Anyway, but, so I'm really looking forward uh, to the day that Dorito releases its uh, plugin API that might come to us at some point. Because, yeah, I mean, for me, it's only interesting when it's hackable. <laughs> so for automation purposes, um, software with um, open or, or readable data formats, not only by the software, but outside, are clearly an advantage. So LilyPond, MuseGore, Capella as well, or Score even. Um, you, you could write tools without the actual software and have the freedom to, to use wherever ever you want to process the data. Um, so from, from these, I think uh, uh, is the most um, likely that might be used, but um, for us it's, it's really a, a big a shift uh, in, in, would be a really big shift in how we work and um, we, have, we feel that it's still lacking in interface form, for it, uh, specifically that it's uh, hard to introduce in our workflows. So I've talked about all these little ad hoc solutions. They are all well and good, but have to be something like a bigger vision. Um, yeah, one important topic for us is um, optimizing our workflows, so to say. Um, to, to f and, but that's really a hard thing to do because every, every job is special. Every job has tight deadlines. Uh, the requirements within each job change constantly and that makes it really hard to develop workflows that, that you can follow consistently. So when we're talking about Scrum and so on, this is all well and good if you can plan a week ahead or something, but if you have new information on an hourly basis or something, then it's really hard to, to follow these, these approaches. Um, one, one thing that would also be nice to, to more integrate all these little tools and steps to have into a bigger thing that makes up one, one big workflow, but that dream might be still far from, from now. So our, our dream, if, if I could wish for something, it's, it's uh, planning on longer terms, um, that composers would come to us early and if we can work something out with them and say, well, you could use this and we can write you this part and then you, you work much more efficient and we can, can uh, do things early. Uh, 
this is possible with long-term collaborations, of course, then we can approach this this, this thing slowly, possibly. Um, but usually we are caught up in our day-to-day -day work and we only have limited budgets and um, it's, it's difficult to, to innovate in this kind of environment. In any case, as a single player, it's really hard to lift this whole industry to, to the next level. So, um, Maybe to, to end this, this talk with some questions um, for us all. What, what, are, what visions can we come up with uh, to follow together in our industry and what standards can we establish uh, for, for collaboration to make things work more smoothly? Are there digital means? Are there other means? Um, this is something that might be the, the perfect place to follow this, these questions few days that we have here. Okay, many thanks. That was my contribution to the discussion. So thanks so much for this more technical side. Yeah. And are there any questions? Some wild dreams about that, yeah. Um, it, it's of course difficult with proprietary formats. Um, so what, what might be so um, what, what we usually want is to to be able to to follow what what happens. Mm -hmm. We usually don't want to go back to something. We just want to know what happened and if there are problems, what may be the causes of that. Um, so for us, it would be a big step forward if we could actually, for example, have a, a dump of the most important information and then version version that. So not 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 as data that we edit, but just as data that we can use to to follow what was done and yeah, the, the history basically. Um, I might have I might have a partial answer. It's not a proprietary format, but Musical recently reorganized their internal file format to make it more easily editable, so you can just use Unix text tools like Git, uh, Git even on it. I uh, put all my new score files into Git. Uh, you cannot do that when you use a native file format, which is a container which also contains the pictures and stuff, but you can just save it as uh, XML and use that. And uh, they implemented an in-program Git, uh, which uh, also highlights the changes, which is something that proprietary um, software authors could also do. Sibelius has some features in that regard. It has versioning, but as far as, as we can see, it's just a copy of the old files in the not, file. Not versioning, it's really a live diff. So you open two copies of the same document, or the safe copy and the in-memory copy, and it shows you the differences in the store, in the graphical form. Okay, so for my private projects, that's really interesting to be able to diff things and to, to version control them, but I think that's just my uh, in this regard. It's it's not for for the complex for, for the complex music you're dealing with here. Is it possible with this system to use to be truly multi-user to for everybody to be working on the same project? You mean musical? Yeah. yeah. Or do you have a better choice? No, we, we have to split up and merge again if if we want to distribute. I will do that in the music as well. I've done my fair part of XML editing in it. Okay. So. Uh, what would be your vision for a true multi-user environment? Um, I mean, if we had a when I when I, when I said um, integrated, I, I mentioned collaborative platform. I didn't say anything about it, but that would be great if we could have some collaborative platform where we can all come and then we can say, please do this work, uh, finish this job, and you just go to the platform. We don't have to send around the, the files. 
Uh, we don't have to make sure that everybody has the latest version of the file and so on. Yeah, that would be, of course be, be great if we had that. Yeah? I hope I didn't miss it, but at what point in your process does the work of the, that was Steve talking about this morning come? When you spoke to her this morning, she had a definite input into the process. At what point do you put that there in the process? The beginning, the middle, or the end? I didn't get, get what, uh, what what Ms. Gould was saying this morning yeah. about her work in, in making a better product. Where does that come into your, your work for? That's basically the main, I think it, it, it's, it's throughout, but I think that the main thing is the first phase. Most important to make sure that everything is clarified with all, all the parties involved. Um, this is also the step where you would make decisions like change rests or beaming or whatever um, and maybe try to convince the composer but just do it or whatever it depends on, on the situation really so um, I think the first step is the, so step, the most important step with the problems will come in that respect. yeah you look through everything that you have and try to yeah to look ahead and, and find the, the, the problems before they occur in the work because I was very taken by the concept you said she goes to rehearsals to find out where the problems turn out to be in what the problems are there. We are not paid for that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? I, I have two comments. Uh, not allowed loud enough. I, do you uh, have? The one thing is, uh, we use all, we use, all of us use uh, uh, computer programs for notating the music, but we still uh, use the word music a great. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> right. right. I, I considered. I have a version, I guess. I, I, I thought I would wanted to use music typesetter all throughout the talk, but I said maybe that's, that's too confusing because I think the same thing it, it invokes uh, something that's not happening. I think you have to invent something which will categorize what you're doing. Yeah, so it's something mythical that we, that we do and we are engraving yeah, things in the You have to keep the artistry in. Yeah. Don't make it typesetting all day out because you know it is there is there is the artist that at the end of the day delivers what you do. Know? Yeah. So our our job does not feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> then you underestimate your ability. <laughs> Software, uh, other than by book. So they don't do these new errors. 
Um, I don't. Just as simple as that. <laughs> Anybody has any recommendations? I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned the score. The score. Uh, who do you buy it from? <laughs> Today? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so the, the thing was when the last paper box with the last serial number written on it by hand was sold, I think that was the last copy of score ever sold. <laughs> So the, 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 the programmer who, that wrote it single-handedly died a few years ago, so, and, and since then nothing has happened. No, it, 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 it depends probably on the on the uh, yeah legal situation in your country. Do we have do we have a search code for free? For what? For score. For score? No, we don't. I, I still use score occasionally. Yeah. I bought it um, twenty years ago. Um, it is still possible to get a copy of score if you already have a license, and there is a company in London that will do that for you. If you don't have a license, I don't know whether he will help. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, there's a company called New Notation yeah. that still does it. Yeah. But don't you need special old hardware? Yes, you, there, there's a couple of um, uh, uh, like OS simulations that you have to use. Yeah, you, you, you can. Run, you will not run those modern versions of Windows, so you have to use some kind of DOS simulation. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's one of written for like, playing DOS games, but it also runs for and the it's, it's actually, if you look at it like that, it, it might be one of the most portable uh, mutations ever because it can run on any platform this emulator runs on. Yeah, right. If I could try to petition the ears of Newton Smith, whether they want to get out of this. We could. I knew him, and I knew his daughter. If you've seen the interview on the NAM website of Newton Smith, I did that interview. Uh, I, we could ask. Um, I, I, there have been many people who asked already, and yeah. there has been no progress. I, I think we should, if, if you're interested in this, you should ask Steve Gibson, who runs a company called New Notations in London, because he was close to Lee as well, and he probably still has some rights to sell. I'm not sure. But, so let me say, let me say this about the score. It's, it's, it's a great system in that it's so transparent and gives you so much control over, over every aspect. Um, I don't think the source code is key to this because it's, it's, it is so simple, really, it, and that that started my fascina fascination with, with the whole topic because it's so transparent. You can see everything that, that happens. Basically, there is some magic in, in the in the justification routines, but um, there have been improvements on, on that side. Yes. So um, there would be room, I think, to take this concept to a, to a new level, but I don't think you want to work yeah, with old uh, source code. I, I use it for only one thing. I use it for opening old score files, yeah. and generating um, uh, instrument lists and stuff, to make them like easier to convert. It's very easier to convert to something else. In other words, cleaning them up in score prior to converting them to a more modern format. Mm -hmm. so maybe that's the justification for using the traditional terms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, um, thanks very much.